What's going on you guys and welcome back to another video on the channel. If you are new here, my name is Brandon and the topic of today's video is we're going to be discussing 10 things that I wish I knew before I got started with investing or at least here 10 things that I've learned over the years, 10 things that I think would be valuable if I were starting off as a beginner. I know nobody really cares to hear about like my background or what is, you know, who's this guy up here talking about all this stuff, but I think it is important to kind of preface things with this. I have been investing for well over a decade now. So although I'm still relatively, I'm still really young in the big scheme of things. I've actually been doing this for as long as I can remember. Mutual funds getting started with the help of my dad. I bought my first stocks when I was just a young, young boy. And I mean, I even went out and got my license here. Uh, I actually became a licensed advisor when I was 20. So this goes back to 2013 when I was studying and taking my exam work and whatnot. So I have had some experience over the years. At least I like to think so. And I really hope that you guys enjoy kind of some of my thoughts on where beginners can, where am I going with this? I hope you guys enjoy the 10 things that I wish I knew before I got started with investing. The first thing is a very simple one. This one that people will fall for all the time and that is falling for fads and trends. And this isn't actually just for new investors. This happens to everybody because I think on a base level, what this comes down to is psychology. Human psychology is what draws people in and out of these trends and hot uh, topics and areas. But in almost all cases, the fads that I've seen over the years, well, I guess that's kind of why they get the name fads. They usually die out and they usually don't end well for investors. You've probably uh, lived through either the Bitcoin craze, the marijuana stocks is one that kind of comes to mind where absolutely people do see success up front and i think that's kind of what draws the hype and excitement around them is that yeah there are people going through and actually making some good money up front but if you're a long-term investor and you think hey this is a revolutionary area or this is you know this technology is going to be the next big thing by the time you catch drift of it and jump in it usually ends up burning people and my philosophy on that is why even go there when you can just kind of stick with what works and sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's not as exciting. Buying the old, you know, traditional companies, the healthcare companies, the consumer goods companies, the financials, the big banks, it's not as flashy, but it's proven to work. So I know in the future, as with the past, there will be new things that come up, uh, new this or that, and it's gonna be exciting, it's gonna pique your interest. By all means, if you wanna take the little speculation on it and go for it, you can, but just be careful and just know that a lot of times it ends up biting biting you back in the butt. Next up is one that kind of relates to that. If you did find yourself falling for a fad, let's take the MJ sector. One thing I wish I knew is that it's not always best to wait for a stock to break even. And if you own a stock right now in your portfolio that is down significantly, that has crashed, I'm not gonna name any particular stocks, but there's probably a couple that a lot of the YouTube community will know quite well. It's so, so common for someone to want to, uh, they'll come in with the mindset, they'll have the approach that I'm gonna hold these stocks until I recoup my losses, until I make my money back. And the second I do, I'm gonna call it a wash and then never look at these stocks again. And I do like the mindset in a sense that, yeah, you don't wanna sell at a loss, you don't wanna trigger your loss, but we always need to keep in mind that sometimes cutting our losses and moving our money into a better place can be the better decision in the long run. And I know it sucks. Like nobody ever wants to take a loss, especially when you're down significantly. Uh, you got some big, big uh, losses on paper that you don't want to realize. But at the end of the day, some companies don't ever make it back up to the levels that they were trading at before. We like to think that the good companies do. And if you look back at history on a quality business, they tend to have their ups and downs. But if you invested in something that is not yet proven, that is not yet established, and we have so much, there's still so much unknown about the future, what's to say that this stock never recovers? And now you're just sitting on a pool of dead money when if you looked at it rationally and you were able to strip the emotions out of it, you can take that money and put it to work somewhere else. There's a fallacy that we kind of talk about sometimes, it's, it's called the sunk cost fallacy, which is essentially the fact that you've already got skin in the game, you've already 
you know where you bought in. It just kind of keeps you tied in the roots of your original purchase, your original trade, which can really, really uh, make you biased towards what to do with the stock. You need to look at it with, you know, take a step back and take a look at the dollar value of your position and say, hey, can that money be used somewhere else? And in some cases it can, in some cases it can't. It's just a mistake to think that it's always right to let your investments recover uh, to um, to recoup the losses that you had. Number three, one I got actually a personal story for you guys, a little bit of an example. That is that you don't want to invest money, more money than you can. Kind of investing beyond your means. And I know that's not related to stocks, like the portfolio management, it's not related to stocks itself, but as a new investor, you can very commonly actually over contribute to your portfolio in the sense that you're so eager to get started, you're so eager to put money away and you're excited, you're enthusiastic about your future that you actually put more money than you should into your investing account. And my philosophy on this, the way that I've always liked to look at it is you wanna put the right amount aside that you can never try to touch that again. Treat it like it's gone and still keep some money in your savings account, in your checking account, so that you can go out and do things and you don't ever have to think about dipping into this pool. That way you can really just let your investments do what they should be doing, the whole long-term passive approach. And I learned this lesson the hard way. This goes back a number of years when we had a Mexico trip planned. I was going to Mexico with some of my friends and at the time I needed a thousand dollars from, uh, to pay for the all the all inclusive excursion, and for whatever reason, I guess I didn't have a thousand dollars in my uh, bank account. I probably wasn't working. Whatever it was, I just needed the money. So the only place I looked to was my investment account. And stupid enough, I did this without consulting my dad. At the time, I pulled it out of my RRSP, which, as some of you may or may not know, when you take money out of an RRSP you lose that space forever. You don't get to recontribute that like a TFSA. So essentially, because I overextended myself, I now have $1,000 less space in my RSP than I would have if I would have just left my money there. And of course it would have been better to be growing rather than spending it. But point being is that I could have avoided that situation in the first place if I would have invested within my means and budgeted properly to have the right amounts going here, the right amounts going there. That's just a funny story. And it was one that I learned a lesson the hard way, but this does happen all the time. People invest, you know, their down payments, which they know they're gonna need. They invest money here and there, only invest money for the long term that you can kind of say is for the long term. There's not really a better way of putting that. Well, there's definitely a better way of putting that, but I think you guys get the gist of it. Next up on the list, never listen to the headlines. And this goes for TV, this goes for online, this goes for articles. One thing about me was when I got started really involving myself in the investing world and I was really trying to absorb everything, I watched a religious amount of BNN. So Business News Network and BNN Bloomberg it is now, but I watched just show after show after show. I knew the whole time slot. And I remember going to my dad early on and saying, holy cow, like what an awesome place for knowledge. Like I know so many stocks and I feel like I got it all figured out now. And he just looked at me and just kind of, kind of scoffed. He didn't really scoff at me. He, he wouldn't do that, but he just kind of chuckled it off. I said, you know, you, you must like BNN, right? He goes, no, I don't really watch it. And I'm thinking to myself, what? Like, this is the best freaking channel out there. Uh, news related and I'm learning cool things and getting opinions here and there. And now fast forward a few years to where I am today. I don't ever really tune into that stuff anymore. It's a bunch of, don't get me wrong. It's an awesome place if you're a beginner and you're looking to learn the terms and the lingo and you want to absorb the world of finance or investing, I should say. Fantastic for that. And it's actually, I mean, kind of contrasting to what I say, I think it's an awesome place to start learning, but never take what they're saying to heart because at the end of the day, they are in the business of entertainment and they're in the business of provoking emotion with headlines and topics. And I mean, BNN's not the worst, but when you look over to the States and you see, you know, CNBC, 
the headlines, the breaking news, the panic they try to instill sometimes with their guests, with the show hosts, just speaking about what's going on in the world of the stock market. They should be there to help us as investors and as a new person, you can really think they are. You can really think that the advice that they're telling you is gonna put you in the right direction. But by listening to that advice, by listening to their opinions, which are very much short term, very much short sighted, what's happening now, uh, jibber jabber that's going on, you're probably gonna end up screwing yourself when if you didn't even turn on that channel to begin with and you just let your investments do their thing over a number of years, you'll probably do a whole lot better doing that. So takeaway is that, yeah, watch these networks. I think they're super cool for staying informed, but don't ever listen to the headlines because again, they're just there to really, they're a business and their business makes money by getting our views. So they don't really have our best interest in heart. They're trying to make that money. Don't ever forget that. Next up on the list, let's go with this one. Even the experts are wrong. The quote unquote experts. And by that, I'm talking about the economists that come and talk on these shows. You see the super investors like the Ray Dalio's, you know, the Michael Burry's out there. These high profile investors, they love to come out and make statements like they know everything and they'll make a very, very bold prediction that, you know, 30% chance of a recession or by 2022, we'll see this or national debt, so-and-so they're constantly making these predictions and people will see an article and they'll believe it because, Hey, this is a credible person. They've been right before they're professionals in the space. They must know what they're doing. And 95% of the time, more than that, they're just so, so wrong because the stock market is just so complex and there's so many moving pieces that nobody really knows what's going to happen a year from now or six months from now. What we do know, if you look back at the data, is that over long periods of time, we do tend to make money. But when people try to make a short term prediction, three months out, a month out, uh, six months out, what's going to be happening with our economy, which is just a crazy, crazy, vast thing to understand. 99% of the time they're wrong. And these experts, what they'll do is they'll release so many different predictions that you tend to just forget about the previous ones and they wait till they hit that one prediction and hey sooner or later if you're putting articles out left and right making guesses you're gonna hit it sooner or later you're gonna nail the market crash you know on your 10th try or you're gonna nail something and when they do that's the article that blows up like this guy's a genius like they got a fortune ball or a a magic eight ball, crystal ball, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. People tend to forget that these people are constantly making uh, poor predictions and it's just the ones that we, that they do finally hit that stick. So when you do hear someone, even somebody that's very credible, make a short-term prediction, my best advice to that is probably once again, just ignore it. I personally like to listen to Buffett a lot because he doesn't go as far as making those predictions. He's one of the staple investors that say, hey, we don't know this type of thing, so why even bother? And more or less try to you know, take that long-term approach. That's why Buffett's style resides with me, but these other people just goofy. And I know they're considered experts, so they should know, but nobody, nobody really knows. Another one that I think is uh, clear obvious to some, but if you are very new, and this is something that I wish I knew when I got started, invite market crashes rather than fear them. And this of course goes if you are a long-term investor, uh, if you're investing for the short term and you need your money three months from now, don't, this doesn't apply. And you should be investing completely differently in a very safe manner if you do need your money that short term. But for a long-term investor like myself, I think back to 2008, where I was actually in the market. That was right when I kind of started watching over my portfolio and it was much smaller at the time mutual funds actually for the most part, but I saw they were down 20, 25% right when I had put my money in. And I was far too young to comprehend what we were going through in terms of the credit crisis, in terms of the housing collapse. I had no idea what was going on, but I saw that my portfolio was down 25%. And I asked my dad, like, did you pick the wrong mutual funds for me? Like, did you, you screwed me here? I didn't say that, but at the time I just thought, hey, this investing thing isn't as exciting as it seems. Now that I know how the stock market works, 
that should have light up my eyes as a young investor to see the stock market come down rather than looking at that as a negative that is one of the best positive opportunities you can have where stocks are coming down you're seeing discounts across the board is really my favorite way to look at it when the broader market's coming down like that for whatever reason that typically gives you a chance to go buy some really good companies at some really low prices and at the time rather than uh, being negative about it and saying like, oh, this sucks, kind of moping my head around. Knowing what I know now, I would have been looking to put more money in. I would have been excited. I would have been looking to learn just in general, just to experience what it's like to go through a time like that. Obviously, again, I was quite young at the time, but we're going through a good example of this right now. Going through these market crashes is, crashes should excite us because not only do they represent buying opportunities, but they also represent learning opportunities. Some once in a decade uh, once in a lifetime learning opportunities with the case that we're going in through with the case that we're going through right now another one that i think is good is that books when it comes to the stock market can give you some of the best insights on investment philosophies the way different investors approach the market some of the best books i know i get asked from time to time and i've done videos on the channel before they never do well <laughs> people don't tend to click on them but people do ask for them some of my favorite books to get started when you are a beginner one up on wall street's a great one i always say the intelligent investor is not a beginner book but that's obviously a classic to read and sorry i'm getting too ahead of myself one up on wall street is a book by peter lynch who was one of, who's known to be one of the best growth investors of all times. He managed a mutual fund back in the day that had exceptional performance, well above the average. His book basically goes on to teach you how the average investor, even someone like you and I, we can identify trends, we can identify patterns in our life, uh, things we see around us, and actually go on to make some very good investment choices by going out and identifying individual stocks. That really gives you an insight into his mindset on things. The next book I was gonna talk about is The Intelligent Investor, which is written by Benjamin Graham, who, as many of us know, this is actually Warren Buffett's mentor. So if you wanna take a value approach on investing and you wanna see how that's done, you can just get a polar opposite side of the spectrum, seeing how a value investor, how Buffett approaches the stock market versus a growth investor like Peter Lynch. And if you were starting out, if I was a beginner, I mean, I didn't read these books till I started getting deeper into my investing hobby of when I had an interest in this, but I would get started right off the bat with taking a look at some of these options, taking a look at some of the, the best books which display all the ways to do it, and then finding out which one would reside best with you. I know people like watching videos on YouTube. You can go back and find old interviews and whatnot, and hey, that's a great way of getting some insight, but there's nothing like reading a good book, and that's something that I wish I had done earlier for sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got seven so far, so let's go for number eight. Number eight. <laughs> Which one do I wanna pick here for number eight? Um, here's one. Chasing previous performance. So the best performing funds in the past, often gonna get you screwed going forward. And it's fascinating how the stock market works with its ups and downs. And I mean, really, it is constantly going through its cycles with peaks and valleys and ebbs and flows. And if you are an investor, I mean, it's a very logical thing for an investor to think this, but if you're looking for an investment, let's say you're looking for a mutual fund or an ETF, you can very easily look at, hey, what was the best performing fund last year? right? Or what's performing well right now, because that's what we can expect going forward. And like, let's say we're in 2020, you'd go look at, you know, 2019 best performing sectors or ETFs or funds, and you go to put your money there. And more often than not, you check back in a year later, you probably ended up buying up near the top. And again, just understanding that things are constantly going through their flows, or their ups and downs of things, just because something performed well last year, does not mean you can expect that to continue into the next year. And you do come across companies that are sustained. They have sustained excellence. They do well over decades, which is true. Um, you do find those. But if you are chasing sectors, if you're chasing the results of last year, it really does screw you. <laughs> I've learned that firsthand with some mutual funds. You know, if you were literally picking the one in the top like percentile of its class or of its sector, monitor that over the next year or two. 
I'd bet you good money that you'll find that near the bottom or not up near the top. It's very hard for a fund to like a mutual fund, for example, to sustain that top percentile quarter after quarter after quarter, year after year after year. What I actually find uh, is kind of more of a value approach strategy is going for some of the worse investments, going for some of the dogs, because believe it or not, those ones do pick up. When they fall out of favor, people forget about them and they do offer good opportunities, but don't chase the, uh, the best performing funds because those will definitely get you screwed. Eight, let's go to nine here and then finish off with 10. 10, I know what I wanna finish with. You know what? Let's just jump into 10 right now. Nine things that I wish I knew before I started investing. And this one, I actually have to give a shout out to PPC Ian, who is, if you're not subscribed to his channel, you should go check him out because he's got my favorite investing channel, a dividend investor down in the US. He used an analogy saying that investing is like soap. The more you handle it, the more it deteriorates or something along the lines of that. I forget the exact uh, example. And that was one that was new to me, but this is something that I've learned time and time again over the years. It's really one of the most valuable lessons that I've just acquired and it didn't happen overnight, but it just kind of grew and the belief kind of confirmed over years and years of investing that messing with your investments by jumping in and out of things, thinking you can make a smart play here and there, tooling around with trades and this and that. Like a bar of soap, the more you handle it, the less and less it gets. Your money deteriorates, your portfolio. If you're in there buying and selling, paying commissions, trying to outsmart the market, you will see your portfolio deteriorate the same way that a bar of soap would just turn into suds and just kind of evaporate with time because investing for the long term, it's really one of those unique, unique processes where people think they have to get so complex and they think they have to get so involved, but by taking a step back and just letting the investments do their thing, kind of letting the passive nature of just hands off, letting them grow and snowball and compound, the data backs up that that's usually the best thing you can do. And smart people will think they can outsmart the market and they'll go in and tool around. And although they won't admit it, their portfolios do suffer by constantly micromanaging things. Just set your stuff up the right way. Put money in on a consistent basis. Or if you're older, for example, make sure you got a really solid balance. You got a good fundamental, you know, you got your parameter set, which is appropriate for you. Make sure you're all balanced accordingly and then just let it be. That is really the principle that, that I live with. And when I did come across that uh, soap analogy, I thought I had to use it. In fact, it kind of sparked the uh, topic for today's video. That is really one thing I wish I knew when I started. I've learned over the years through uh, experiments and errors and trying to trade here and there. It just doesn't work most of the time, unless maybe you want to dedicate your whole life to this, but that's not what we talk about on this channel. We talk about long-term investing and hopefully some of these things were able to just share some new sites, insights into things to avoid, things that may help you out, especially if you're new in the game. I really hope you enjoyed my thoughts on this. If you did, and uh, if you are new, you can like this video, uh, drop a thumbs up. That's a great way of supporting. And you can subscribe for more content. We post new videos every week. Again, I do appreciate everyone that's been on the channel. And if you're new here, uh, stick around. We post lots of videos. We always have our investing academy. So if you are here in Canada and you want help with setting up your accounts, setting a strategy, kind of getting guided through that process, we're working with Canadians every day, all online, helping them go through that. That's our investing academy is the first thing down below. But as always, I thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next video.